Hello, everybody. Dr. B here again. Forgot to show you uh, my t shirt for the day. Um, the element of confusion. I think that's a new one for you all. Anyway, just like to share my science t shirts with you as a way to get us going. Um, I know it's chemistry, not physics, but remember, all chemistry is based on physics. All right. So, we're going to continue in module seven, which is just a continuation of module six, just looking at forces and Newton's laws. And today we're going to delve into friction. So here's an example, uh, an x-ray from a total hip replacement surgery. And that's certainly a case where we want to have minimal friction. Uh, there, there are lots of cases in our lives where we want to minimize friction, and this is one of them. Um, but also keep in mind that without friction, we wouldn't be able to move or we wouldn't move in the same way. So for example, walking wouldn't happen. Okay? We rely on fr static friction to push us forward when we walk. Our cars and our bikes wouldn't work without static friction. So friction can uh, you know, be bad and slow us down or cause us to use more full, but it's also the way that we get moving. So. That is a, uh, a good thing to recognize as we get into this. All right, some equations. And these are on your equation sheet. So as always, keep your equation sheet handy and uh, refer to it often as you do the note packet, as you do the expert TA, as you do the lab, um, always have your equation sheet there and be referring to it. All right, so FS, this is a lowercase f. This is different than what um, expert TA uses. Uh, but it is what your book uses. So F sub S is less than or equal to mu S times F in. And remember, your textbook uses in for normal force. We've talked about that before, but we're using F in so we don't get it confused with the symbol for Newtons, which is capital N. All right. So this is not an equation. This is an inequality, but it's an important inequality. And it's something you're going to explore in the lab with your spring scale. And you'll be able to see for yourself that the static friction is this kind of, I call it a magic self-adjusting force. Now, it's not really magic, um, but it does self-adjust. And so basically the static friction will be whatever it needs to be up to a point. Okay, it'll be whatever it needs to be up to a point. Up to what point? Well, up to this point, okay, less than or equal to. Okay, so it can be as big as this, but it can also be smaller. And it, it's just as big as it needs to be. This is a redundant thing here, but this is an actual equation saying that the maximum amount it can be is this much, which we already knew from here. And then we've got the kinetic friction here. I don't know why the Ks are underlined. That's just a weird formatting thing. That's not typical. That's just on this particular slide here. Uh, but FK is equal to mu K times F sub N. And you'll find kinetic friction is really quite easy to deal with uh, because it doesn't have that amb ambiguity of less than or equal to. It's just equal to this amount. Uh, kinetic friction is when two things are moving relative to each other. And static friction is when two things are not moving relative to each other. So like I mentioned before, um, static friction comes into play when you're walking. Okay. So when you push off, you put your foot down on the floor and you push, your foot and the floor are not sliding relative to each other. Well, at least not most of the time. Um, but a typical walking motion, you put your foot down, your foot doesn't slide. Okay, Your leg is, is tilting forward at that same time, but your foot's not sliding. So that's static friction. Um, there's simpler examples of static friction, like you push on your bed from the side, not too hard, and it doesn't move. That's static friction holding it. Um, kinetic friction, two surfaces are sliding relative to each other. Okay, that's why shoe when you're walking is not kinetic friction because the foot is sliding relative to the floor. Okay, and again, typical walk. Uh, same thing with tires on the road. Most of the time your tires are not sliding and so there is static friction between your tire and the road. Um, if you slam on the brakes and you lock them up, which is hard to do with any lock braking system these days, uh, but if you did that, especially you can still do that on a bike, um, then your tire is sliding relative to the road and that's kinetic friction. All right, 
one thing to look at here, this is normal force. This is static friction force, um, normal force, kinetic friction force. Those all have units of Newtons. But then we've got mu s and mu k. Those are the coefficients of static friction and kinetic friction, respectively. And those have what units? Hmm. Well, if we look here at either one of these equations, if we divide by f sub n, then we get the mu by itself on the right side. And on the left side, we have a force divided by a force. And so Newtons divided by Newtons. Oh, so the coefficient of friction has no units. Okay, it's dimensionless. All right, and that's something important to keep in mind. Uh, the force of static friction and the force of static friction, those are forces. They can be on your free body diagram. Coefficient of static and kinetic friction are not forces and therefore should not be on your free body diagram. All right. Whether it's static or kinetic, friction depends on the textures of surfaces. And that's what the mu s and mu k represent, has to do with the textures. It's really for a pair of surfaces. So if you look up in table 5.1 in your textbook, you will see various pairs of surfaces. And there's a mu s and mu k listed for each pair of surfaces that they list there. Now, there's many, many more combinations of surfaces that could rub against each other than what is listed there, but that's a sampling. You can find lots more on the internet if you are interested. And, and there's, of course, more authoritative uh, sources as well. So friction depends on the texture of the surfaces, textures of both surfaces, um, and also on how tightly pressed the surfaces are to each other. And this is represented with F sub n, okay? Now, you might have thought, oh, the amount of friction depends on the weight. And you're kind of right, because the weight can influence how big the normal force is. But remember, we've already seen that the normal force is not always equal to the weight. Okay, When you have something on an incline, the normal force is less than the weight. If you had something uh, pressed against a uh, horizontal, sur I mean, a vertical surface. So if you're, I mean, this is kind of silly, but if you were pushing a book and holding it in place against a wall, the weight is not influencing how tightly pressed the book is to the wall, okay? It's how hard you're pushing is influencing how tightly pressed the book is to the wall. And then there's static friction acting up and weight acting downward, okay? But the point is we want to be as clear as we can and the forces of friction are dependent on the normal force, not the weight. The normal force might in turn be dependent on the weight, but it might not be. Again, depends on the situation. All right, here's an example from your textbook. And this is uh, similar to one of your uh, expert TA problems. So if we were pushing on a block, right? And it's, it's ice, that this happens to be ice on ice, and this one also ice on ice, would it be better to push on the block at an angle downward and 25 degrees, uh, 25 degrees below horizontal, or pull on it at an angle 25 degrees above horizontal. And so it's not whether it's pulling or pushing that's, that's better, but is it above 25 or below 25 that is the better way to do it? Or is it the same either way? And so I think this is something that requires a little more uh, analysis. All right, and now I switched over to my iPad using it as a document camera here. And so, like I said, we're trying to figure out which of these would be better. And so for each one, we could draw a free body diagram. So there is a normal force, there's weight, there's this force F. And let's say we're trying to find out the, um, there's less force, let's say to move at constant velocity. So we'll say they're already in motion, but we just want to keep them moving at constant velocity. So that means if it's in motion that we're dealing with FK, okay? So that's this one. And then down here, we've got normal force, weight, F, and FK. And I'm not worrying about the length of the forces at this point. Uh, just trying to uh, get all the forces down there, get them the right direction, and then we'll go from there. 
So we'll use up as our positive y direction and right as our positive x direction for the whole thing. So summing forces in the x direction. And this for this one, okay, it's always good when you're summing forces to know which free body diagram it's going with. Okay, this goes with this, not with this. And summation of forces in the y direction. All right. So if it's moving along at a constant velocity, if it's if it's moving along a horizontal surface, even if it were speeding up, it wouldn't be changing its vertical velocity. So Vy would be constant, which means Ay is going to be zero. But in this case, we also said it was moving horizontally at a constant velocity. So that means Ax is also zero. So we have Fn is upward minus the weight minus F which is our applied force, but not all of it, just part of it, just F sine of 25 degrees, and that's equal to zero, okay? Because this F force is made up of a F sub X and an F sub Y. And so the F Y is opposite the 25 degrees. And so it ends up being F sine 25. And we could write that out, sine of 25, equals F Y or F, and then we multiply both sides by F to get that F Y is equal to F sine 25. So the normal force is not equal to the weight, it's equal to the weight plus F sine 25 degrees. And then we know that friction is equal to mu S times F N. So friction is equal to mu S times W plus F sine 25 degrees. Okay. And then in the x direction, we have F cosine 25 degrees minus FK equals zero. And F cosine 25 degrees equals FK. And we can substitute this in. So F cosine 25 equals mu S times W plus F sine 25. And if we're trying to figure out how big F is, well, that's going to require a little bit more effort on our part. But we can already see that we're going to have, well, let, let me just go ahead and do the same thing down here for, for this case, and then, and then we'll talk about what it means. So in the y direction, we have Fn plus F sine 25 degrees. So here we had a minus because the y component was downward. But in this case, the y component of the F force is upward minus W equals zero. So now the normal force is equal to the weight minus F sine 25 degrees, opposite sine of there. The friction is equal to mu S times W minus F sine 25. So very, very similar, but there's that important difference. And then in the X direction, We have F cosine 25 minus FK equals zero because the object's moving at a constant velocity. So if V sub X is constant, that means A sub X is zero. So F cosine 25 equals mu S times W minus F sine 25 degrees. All right, so one thing is we could look here at this value for coefficient, I'm sorry, for the force of kinetic friction, it's equal to kinetic friction coefficient times W minus F sine 25, or and I did it again. I don't know why I'm putting a mu S. Sorry about that. There we go. I think I fixed them all. So it's mu K and then times W and then either plus F sine 25 or minus F sine 25. So the friction, the force of friction is going to be larger in this case because the normal force is bigger. Okay, if this part's bigger, then that makes the force of friction bigger. So here, this is going to be harder because there's going to be more friction. Okay, so we can tell that already. If we're just trying to answer that question, we can tell that already. All right, now algebraically, if we were trying to solve for F, 
you can see we have F here and we have F there. So we need to do a little more work to get F by itself because it shows up twice. So I'm going to distribute the mu k to both terms. So now I have this term which has f, this term which has f. I'm going to put them on the same side. f cosine 25 degrees minus mu k times f sine 25 equals mu k w. And now this has f in both terms. So I can write it as f times cosine 25 degrees minus mu k sine 25 degrees equals mu k w. And then I'm running out of room here. But the next and last step to solve for f would be to divide both sides by cosine 25 degrees minus mu k sine 25 degrees. And like I said, I just ran out of room there. But that's just an algebra thing. And that's something that people run into trouble with. But again, to figure out which one is going to be harder to push, we, we need not look any further than this expression here compared to this expression here. When he's pulling this way, he's reducing the normal force, which reduces the amount of friction. And when he's pushing like this, he's increasing the normal force, increases the amount of friction. And in both cases, the x component is making up the same percentage of his overall force. Um, so really, it, it's pretty clear at this point that the advantage goes to this one as being the easier way to do it. And again, not worried about the mechanics of pushing or pulling, but just the, the physics of, of looking at the way the numbers work out. All right, can we pause there? OK, and so we're back to the PowerPoint now. And I have a couple of true or false here. The greater the surface area, the greater the amount of friction. What do you think? It's false. Look at the, look at the equations for friction. It's equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. Doesn't have area in there. I know it's surprising, but it does not depend on area. All right. Uh, number two, the amount of kinetic friction is always equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the weight of the object. That's false. It would be true if the normal force were equal to the weight, which it is sometimes, but not always. It's equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force. Okay, so we should put the normal force here and then it would be correct. All right, so false and false. Uh, the unit for the coefficient of static friction is then Newton. We talked about this. Do you remember what the unit is for this? Right, it's false because there's no unit. It's unitless. And finally, the size of the static friction force is always equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. What do you think? This one's false as well. Okay, because Remember, static friction is less than or equal to mu s times Fn. So this is the biggest it can be, but that's not how big static friction always is. And there's a good section in your note packet where it goes through uh, three cases where somebody is pushing on a 10 Newton block and they push on it with a certain amount of force and they go through the calculations, they push on it with a different amount of force and they go through the calculations. So that's a really good uh, thing to look at. All right, remember, as I've been talking about in these module seven videos, it's the same steps as in module six. You're still gonna pick what it is you're analyzing. You're gonna draw a free body diagram. You're gonna pick a coordinate system. You're gonna apply the second law. What's different for friction problems? Well, you've got those two friction equations. Otherwise, same thing. All right, and let's just take a quick look, see if I can find that. Um, example that I was talking about. All right, so I mentioned an example in your note packet. This is for module seven, starting on page 10. So what if somebody pushes with a horizontal force of five Newtons? In this case, the maximum static friction is six Newtons, but that doesn't mean that's how big the static friction force is. 
the static friction force is only five newtons because that was needed to hold it in place. Okay, what if the person pushes with seven newtons? Well, then how big is the static friction force? Well, there is none. Okay, so we don't have static friction because it's moving. Okay, and then we could figure out the acceleration. And then the third one, what if the woman is pushing on a 10 Newton box, it's already in motion, and there's a horizontal force of five Newton. So this is just like the first one, as far as it being a five Newton force. But in this case, it's already in motion. So we are gonna have kinetic friction. And so we've got an applied force of five Newtons to the right. We've got kinetic friction of four Newtons. And so we can see how much it's speeding up in that case. All right, so that's gonna end my second video for module seven. Still one more to go, so check out the last one which has to do with rotational motion.